Tonight, no regrets, no apology. Accused of racism, Donald Trump doubles down. If you're complaining all the time, very simply, you can leave. You can leave right now. Escalating his attacks on four minority female lawmakers. No matter what the president says, this country belongs to you. Is there any kind of strategy here? Our U.S. political insiders are standing by. How you feeling? I'm feeling great. Never better. Two teen girls found safe after three nights lost in Algonquin Park. We'll hear from the officer who tracked them down. So this is the moon? This is apparently an analog for the moon. It's one small step on the journey to Mars. 50 years after the giant leap, why Canada is shooting for the moon. This is the national. U.S. President Donald Trump is still under siege over his Twitter attack against four Democratic Congresswomen of color, suggesting they go back where they came from. And even while his comments have been widely condemned as racist and dangerous today, Trump seemed content to throw even more fuel onto the fire. If you're not happy here, then you can leave. As far as I'm concerned, if you hate our country, if you're not happy here, you can leave. And that's what I say all the time. That's what I said in a tweet, which I guess some people think is controversial. A lot of people love it, by the way. A lot of people love it. And that is the defiant position Trump is sticking to, even as his targets fire back. Our Katie Simpson walks us through a divisive day in Washington. The four congresswomen targeted by the president appeal to the American people not to fall for what they say is Donald Trump's attempt to divide the country. This is simply a disruption and a distraction. This is the agenda of white nationalists. I heard urge House leadership, many of my colleagues, to take action to impeach this lawless president today. Yep, come in, come in, come in. Not only is Trump standing by his words, he's escalating the fight, even calling one of the women an al-Qaeda sympathizer while dismissing accusations he's rallying white nationalists. It doesn't concern me because many people agree with me. And all I'm saying, they want to leave, they can leave. On Sunday, the president told the Democratic lawmakers to go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-infested places from which they came, then come back and show us how it's done. All four of the women are American citizens. Only Ilhan Omar was not born in the U.S. Today, Trump singled her out for comments she made on Israel and for which she later apologized says horrible things about Israel, hates Israel, hates Jews, hates Jews. For their part, Republicans were mostly quiet today, with few condemning Trump outright. This crowd are a bunch of communists. They hate Israel. They hate our own country. Aim higher. We don't need to know anything about them personally. Talk about their policies. And those who are publicly defending him used reasoning like this. He has an Asian woman of color in his cabinet who came to the United States because because I'm making the case that this is this is not this is not a universal statement that he's making. If Trump's words are dividing Republicans, they're uniting Democrats, and that is exactly what he wants. Trump wants to paint his opposition as one big united group of progressives like these women, socialists, he says, because that's who he wants to campaign against in the 2020 election. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. And two close American allies, including Canada, also expressed disappointment with all of this today. I think uh, Canadians and indeed people around the world uh, know exactly what I think about those particular comments. Uh, that is not how we do things in Canada. A Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. And the diversity of our country is actually one of our greatest strengths and a source of tremendous resilience and pride for Canadians. And we will continue to defend that. For her part, outgoing British Prime Minister Theresa May called Trump's tweets unacceptable, as did the two men competing to replace her. Theresa May has called that completely unacceptable. Do you agree with her? <coughs> yes, I do. Um, <laughs> you, you simply cannot use that kind of language about sending people back to where they came from. 
Neither Hunt nor Johnson would go so far as to call the tweets racist, nor did Canada's prime minister. Now, Trump has been accused of racism before, many times, in fact, and for the most part, it hasn't made a dent with his base. In 2015, Trump was accused of stoking dangerous racial tensions when he claimed Muslim Americans rejoiced in the 9-11 attacks. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering a claim that was widely debunked. Then there was this infamous statement on the campaign trail. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Still, he was elected president. Once in office, many were stunned at his reluctance to immediately condemn white supremacists after the deadly Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in 2017. Very fine people on both sides. Trump did later condemn the violence, but not fast enough for many. Today, two years after that infamous rally, the man who killed a young woman with his car was sentenced. A Virginia state judge handed James Alex Fields another sentence of life in prison, plus 419 years. This on top of the life sentence he was given last month. Heather Heyer was killed and dozens of people were hurt when Fields, a self-professed neo-Nazi, plowed his car into a crowd of anti-racism protesters. Still ahead on The National, we will go in-depth on Trump's comments today. Is there a strategy at play here, and how should the Democrats respond? More with our U.S. political panel. That's a little bit later. Intense relief tonight after two 16-year-old girls spent three nights lost in the woods. After a long, intensive search, they were found safe today in Algonquin Park. It's one of Canada's oldest and biggest parks. At about 7,600 square kilometers, it's one and a half times the size of PEI. Upwards of half a million visitors go there each year. Amid the beauty, some potential dangers, like a couple of thousand black bears. The two girls were lost around here. Lisa Shing takes us through their ordeal. Tired, a bit dehydrated, but otherwise in good shape, Marta Malik and Maya Marata are rescued from the woods and reunited with their families. In the west end of Algonquin Park, the teens were on a six-day hiking trip with a group from the Polish Scouting Association in Canada, which teaches the same survival techniques as the Boy Scouts. All along, they were supposed to break off into smaller groups for a night and then meet up again. Instead, the girls got lost in these woods for three nights. If it was somebody who had no camping experience, if this was a uh, you know, cold, colder time of year, say late fall, then it would be a, a much more serious situation. Instead, they were prepared. They had a tent and food to last them one or two days. When their group reported the teens missing, a major search operation involving nearly 100 people began. Our searchers have covered a lot of territory, and uh, not only on foot, but we had, of course, uh, an LPP helicopter in the air, Ministry of Natural Resources. The trees are dense in Algonquin Park, making it tough to spot hikers from the air. It was this officer and his canine partner, Zoe, who sniffed them out two kilometers from where they were last seen. He starts uh, sniffing more, you know, shows a lot of interest in a certain area, going back for getting excited, you know, tail wagging. Zoe then led the search crew down a trail. Myself and the other members were calling out the girls' names, and at one point we could hear the girls call back, so they blew a whistle three times. Maya and Marta eventually followed the officers' voices back to the trail, lucky because they had been headed further away from their rescuers. Considering there are wild animals here and vast wilderness, police say the fact they were prepared made all the difference. Lisa Sheng, CBC News, Algonquin Provincial Park, Ontario. This is prime season for hiking and camping, so we asked an outdoor outfitter to give us some safety tips. Always let your, your family know or your friends know where exactly you're going to be at what time if you're going for four days and this is where you're supposed to be after four days. Make sure that that's where they know you're going to be. Carry a compass, 
<laughs> carry a compass. I mean, a lot of our smartphones these days like have those apps. But make sure you know how your smartphone compass works and whether it requires internet service. And given the limits of battery charges, maybe get a traditional compass and, of course, learn how to use it. A lot of people don't realize how crazy powerful the sun is. And so if you don't go with proper sun protection, like a hat and, you know, UPF protectant shirt, you could like have sunstroke, you could, you know, get super dehydrated. One of the easiest ways just to make sure that you don't lose your group is just to use markers. So you can actually place markers on trees as you're going along so that you sort of have a meetup place. If you are a you know, a sole person that gets lost from your group, don't wander off too far, just stay in one place because most likely those, the rest of those people will find you instead of you finding them. Also, I don't know, don't, don't get lost actually. <laughs> know where you're going, have a map. Like it's just, you, you have to be so prepared before you go out there. To Calgary now and what can be an adrenaline charged thrill and a storied part of Western history. Yeah, in chuck wagon racing, it is the Calgary Stampede's marquee event, but also its deadliest. Three more horses were put down over the weekend for a total of six at this year's Stampede. That makes this year worse than usual. And as you'll hear from Carolyn Dunn, it's renewed calls to overhaul or even cancel the event. Chance Benz Miller and Ross Knight coming to the finish line. That's the end of Heat 8 on the final day of the Stampede Chuck Wagon races. What you won't see on the CBC Sports broadcast is the crash that ended up with three dead horses. There was an issue in a Heat number 8 down the back stretch, and we're not going to show it to you. CBC says the call to cut the crash footage from the broadcast came at the request of Stampede organizers. CBC Sports says its executive producer agreed out of sensitivity to edit out footage of the tragic accident so that viewers wouldn't be seeing what happened on the track. CBC Sports says it stands by that decision. The sanitization of images of chuck wagon incidents comes amid growing calls for the races to be cancelled. There were major changes to chuck wagon races back in 1986 after 11 horses were killed in this shocking crash. We've got trouble. Just things get tight in the turn. And to this day, the stampede continues to add safety improvements and oversight. But the chucks still account for the most animal deaths at the stampede. We fundamentally oppose these high-risk rodeo events because despite the safety measures that Stampede has put in place, it still continues to happen. The chair of the Independent Chuck Wagon Safety Commission says he trusts the Stampede to make things as safe as possible for the horses. There are 20,000 people in the grandstand every evening uh, who are enjoying the show. But moving forward, I think uh, the Stampede will continue to act in the best interests of the sport and the horses. The Stampede says it will launch a thorough review of its practices around chuck wagon racing, a mainstay of the event since 1923. I think we're looking at, you know, what can we learn, um, but very, very focused on the care of animals throughout that process. But for now, at least, there are no plans to suspend the popular races. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Now, fatal accidents have been a problem for the Stampede for a long time. 102 animal deaths have been recorded since 1986. Chuck wagon racing, the most hazardous sport by far. 72 chuck wagon horses have died or been euthanized. Two cowboys, an outrider and a wagon driver, died after separate crashes in 1996 and 1999. And only three of the previous 33 years have had no human or animal fatalities. Here in Ottawa, Parliament is on summer break, but some MPs returned urgently to the Hill today. They were called back for a special meeting about that huge data breach at Desjardins, one of the biggest ever at any Canadian financial institution. 2.7 million people had their personal information stolen. 173,000 businesses were hit too, mostly in Quebec. As David Cochran tells us, some victims are already feeling the consequences. As a clinical psychologist, Crystal Holly protects sensitive information. She just wishes Desjardins had protected hers. I feel really vulnerable. Um, you know, I don't have the time to be every day looking at every single banking detail to monitor for fraudulent activity constantly. Desjardins says a rogue employee stole the information. Whoever got it next tried to change Holly's address, then ran up big charges on her credit card. Yes, they had made fraudulent purchases as well, which is what signaled the fraud team. Um, I think there was a $1,600 purchase at Walmart, among a few others. 
The sheer scope of the breach led to an emergency parliamentary hearing where even some MPs were affected. You're mad, you're disappointed, uh, but right now I'm focused on, on trying to uh, solve the issue and protect myself further. The breach is expansive. People's names, addresses, uh, dates of birth, social insurance numbers. Addresses, but the committee's IP power address. is limited. Also the consumer protections are provincial in this case. Still, MPs were keen to be seen doing something, so they heard from the RCMP, which isn't even on the case. I'm unable to speak about this particular incident. And the president of Desjardins, who called the whole thing premature because the company is still managing the fallout and police are still investigating. But in the interim, they've offered free lifetime credit protection to Desjardins customers. All the people who were in the list of the members that have been affected by this leak uh, will be taken care of with this program. There's a data breach. But, but it still leaves Crystal Holly worried and anxious. It gives me a little bit of comfort, but not enormous, because I had the credit protection when the fraud happened. So it didn't catch anything. It didn't do anything else. All it shows you is if something has been fraudulent. So I've uh, called them all and asked for the highest level of uh, fraud alert to be placed on my account. But frankly, I don't feel incredibly reassured. And she's not alone. She's one in nearly three million. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National, including a major cleanup in Saskatchewan after severe weather tore through a community. Oh, the wind was horrible. <laughs> he says, I think we're going through a tornado or something fierce. This is what it looked like last night in Eston. That's about a two-hour drive southwest of Saskatoon. Environment Canada says it wasn't a tornado, but rather something called a plow wind, a strong, sudden downdraft. Despite the damage, no one was seriously hurt. Oh my God! Questions are being raised about security after these chaotic scenes at a Toronto music festival. Police responded after people reported hearing gunshots following a fight and that caused people to panic. One official told CBC there wasn't enough emergency exits and people were crushed. The injuries were minor and police only found one bullet. In British Columbia, a man has died of rabies. The 21-year-old dying in a Vancouver hospital on Saturday after he came into contact with a bat in mid-May on Vancouver Island. But it wasn't until six weeks later when he started showing symptoms. The provincial health officer describes the case as extremely rare, but serious. Well, 50 years since one giant leap, we are beginning a special series marking a milestone anniversary of the moon landing. And in our moment, a good deed and a good workout, the teens who pushed a stranger's car seven kilometers in the middle of the night. That sounded good at the beginning and less good at the end. But first, we go in-depth. Two political insiders on why Donald Trump won't back down from his tweets and the meaning of being told to go home from those who have heard it. It sort of sinks quite deep, I think, into, into sort of the psyche. I think in part because it makes you feel as if you don't belong, even if you've spent your entire life in a place. As we all know, the recent tweets and words from the president are simply a continuation of his racist and xenophobic playbook. This is the agenda of white nationalists. Four Democratic Congresswomen of color standing together against offensive comments by U.S. President Donald Trump. This weekend on Twitter, he suggested if they don't like how the U.S. is run, there's the door. Today, he said as much out leave. loud. As far as I'm concerned, if you hate our country, if you're not happy here, you can leave. Trump's comments have raised concerns that he's playing a dangerous political game, even giving cover to white supremacist sentiments. Tonight, we're going in-depth on this story, dominating the conversation in the U.S. and even beyond. So this has certainly opened up some wounds for people, and not just in Washington. We'll get into some of that shortly. But first, what's behind the president's comments today? And to talk about that, I'm joined by Kevin Eckery. He's a Republican strategist in Sacramento, California, and Elena Beverly, a former Obama White House official, and she is in Washington. Good to see you both. Um, Kevin, I'm going to start with you because you're a Republican uh, <laughs> and ask you the, the, the hard question. When you read those comments over the weekend, when you heard those comments from Trump today, what did you make of them? 
Well, I mean, I thought that they were, they were ignorant and racist. I mean, that sort of says that on its face. The, the challenge and as, for, uh, as for it to matter to the, to, the, to the general public and to the electorate. Um, you know, for whatever reason, this guy has been, you know, Teflon. I mean, it makes Ronald Reagan look, look like, you know, everything stuck to him. And we used to call him Teflon. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it was horrible. It's, it's the kind of thing that is embarrassing, frankly, as, as an American to, yeah. to see the President of the United States act in such a manner. But the challenge is, you know, can it make a difference? And I think that's one of the key things that we all have to talk about. So, Elena, why, why wouldn't it make a difference, particularly when we heard from the four women today, some of them with some pretty strong language? Yes, it was a powerful press conference. It was dignified. It was patriotic. Uh, it was strong. Uh, it won't. The, the comments by Donald Trump won't make a difference because the Republicans, uh, it, both in the House and the Senate, will not stand up against him. Uh, he has co-opted the Republican Party, and in their own self-interest, they continue to be silent primarily on his racism. He has a long history of racism. They stood by when he uh, uh, had calls for birtherism. They stood by when he called out very fine people in Charlottesville, and they're standing by now. Well, I was going to say to you, Kevin, I, I wonder if it's not sort of a buildup of pressure that that's where f someone finally says, President Trump, this isn't OK. And again, now we are not seeing much uh, from Republicans. If Republicans no, I mean, started it, to stand up and say something, wouldn't that mean something? Wouldn't it change something? You know, I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a great question. I mean, one of my concerns is that because President Trump has been appealing to, I'll call them low information voters, they seem to be resistant to information, resistant to a lot of the the, the, the truth telling and the fact checking that that you know all of us take for granted. And and part of that is that the people who are supporting him aren't really interested in his words. They're really only interested in his tone. Elena, why do you think the president is targeting these four congresswomen in particular? I think he is race baiting. Uh, I think that he is targeting these four uh, freshman congressmen who are very progressive um, and very outspoken, and he is trying to make them the face of the Democratic Party and exploit recent rifts between the uh, very aggressive, more left-leaning and progressive parts of the Democratic Party and the party uh, and caucus establishment. But it's backfiring because, if anything, this is unifying yeah. the Democratic Party. This is unifying the Congress. You saw Nancy Pelosi come out this weekend immediately defending the, the next generation, this, uh, the squad, if you will. And we, uh, as people of color, uh, as Democrats, are going to stand with them. Uh, if anything, it is going to backfire. Well, and I'm, other, not, I'm yeah, not convinced ahead, it's yeah, I'm not convinced it's going to backfire in that standpoint. And and because one of the things that you're right, I mean, the president is specifically raising these women up to be the the symbol of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and being in the progressive wing, they tend to be left of center, very left of center. Mm -hmm. And he wants to run against those ideas. Now, I I think that the president is reprehensible, and that and that and that everything he touches is is either immoral or a dumpster fire. However. However, the, the challenge is how do you get past talking to your own folks? And the thing is that if, if he succeeds in labeling the, the Democratic Party as, as the Socialist Party, the party that's so far left that they don't care about you know, working people, then you know, that's a notch of success for him. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that might be part of the strategy, but Elena, I wonder if it is not also what, what AOC said in, in the press conference was, because he can't explain and defend his policies, he personally attacks people that are asking him to. That's absolutely right. I think that the majority of voters are, are going to look at the policies that we've um, experienced with regard to immigration and uh, the caging of children at the border, and they're going to think about their own health care, and they're going to think about their own economic circumstances and recognizing that the, t the Trump tax cuts did nothing to make ends meet for their family. I think that the issues that the women uh, of the squad are championing are going to resonate uh, with, with Democratic voters and with, with independent voters. And Trump cannot win with, with squarely with his 
uh, very solid Trump base. Mm -hmm. He needs to expand wow. yeah. uh, to those folks who uh, who decided that they were going to try him uh, the first go around. They, I'm, I'm certain, I'm almost certain that they're going to defect. So, so what, what's the most effective way then to react to him uh, if there was some sort of a strategy behind in, in him? A, in a perfect world, ignore him. I mean, I was one of the things that I've, I've, I've done is I've trained candidates for office who were running in, in countries where they were transitioning from, um, from authoritarian to at least vaguely democratic. And the temptation in those situations is to build your opponent up to be 10 feet tall. But the, the need is to make them either irrelevant or to mock them and yeah. to show that they're not 10 feet tall. They're, they're, they're not tall at all. They're, they're vacuous and horrible people. Elena, that's, Elena, yeah. that's the kind of thing that needs to be done here. As long as Donald Trump controls the conversation, it is, it is going to be hurtful to the country, to the Democrats, and, and also essentially to the Republican Party. Elena, can I just get you in 30 seconds to the same, same question, with the most effective way to react to the, to the president in light of these kinds of comments? So I have to disagree with my colleague just a bit. I think that you have to stand up and, and speak out against racism when you see it. You have to stand up and speak out against xenophobia when you see it. And you have to carry out an agenda. Uh, and I think that's what the Democrats are are going to be doing and what, ha what they have been doing to date. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. Kevin, Elena, thank you. A little more complicated Thanks. than just a couple of tweets, so appreciate your perspectives. Thank you. Few things are more hurtful to people of color, visible minorities, than to be told to go back to where they came from, especially when where they came from is right here. Today, two Canadians who've been through it shared their stories with us. At first, when uh, someone told me to go back to where I came from during high school, it was shocking. I didn't know what they meant because I spent my whole life in Canada and I grew up in Canada. Uh, and then when I realized what that phrase meant, uh, it was quite upsetting. And, and I thought, where should I go? This is where I was born. This is where I was raised. This is where my family is. And this is the only country that I know. It sort of sinks quite deep, I think, into, into sort of the psyche. I think in part because it makes you feel as if you don't belong, even if you've spent your entire life in a place. The first time I've ever experienced that kind of xenophobia or that kind of uh, hatred was when I was in the fourth grade. Uh, we had, were, were walking home from school and, and unfortunately 9-11 had happened. An older gentleman came out and was like, you terrorists, you did this to the US and you're gonna do it to Canada. Like, you need to go back to where you came from. When I woke up and saw the news, it was quite disheartening. It shook me a little because it's been a while since I, I heard that. And to think this day and age, uh, you know, it's 2019 for the, the president of the free world to say such a horrible thing. When you experience it on a on a day to day spectrum, it kind of happens really fast, and you don't know how to address it in the moment. But when you deal with it so publicly and it's kind of ongoing, you you go through a range of emotions. You get, you know, I, for me personally, I was really angry. I was hurt. I'm frustrated that people are so ill-educated, and I think there needs to be a conversation about this, and in, in, it needs to happen like now. What I would say to my children or to other young people who hear the phrase, I think what I would tell them is that you belong, that um, we're all here as settlers, as, as immigrants, uh, except of, obviously if you're an indigenous person, and that this country belongs to more than just uh, those who are saying such awful things. You are the reason why Canada is such a strong country in the first place. Like your diversity is what makes our country a better place. Your, your unique ideas, your unique views, and your, your unique persona is what contributes to the fabric of this country, right? And that's what makes us strong as Canadians. And today, Twitter said that it will not take any action against Trump's tweets about the four Democratic Congresswomen as they didn't break any rules. Okay, next on The National. The world marks 50 years since humans first landed on the moon. And next, we begin our special anniversary series by looking at Canada's role in the future of space travel. This is very real. I mean, Canada is really going to the moon. Uh, the future is really here. Plus, why getting back to the moon could be a first step on the road to Mars. Next. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. If you were around for it, you probably remember it. July 20th, 1969, the day Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. It was a breathtaking achievement. Humans had only started venturing into space a decade earlier. And this week, the National is marking the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 with a special series. 
<laughs> and tonight we explore the renewed fascination with the moon. There's fresh interest in going back. More than half a dozen countries have already launched lunar missions. And Canada is getting on board with an American one. David Common explains why. Even at the dawn of moon exploration, Canada was there. Beautiful, just beautiful. Sure, it wasn't our flag being planted, but the legs for the Apollo 11 spacecraft, they were built in Quebec. Around the world, people were captivated, amazed, inspired. I remember very vividly looking at the black and white picture and taking a black and white photograph with my little Kodak of, and I still to this day have this photograph. Really? Really. Jules Leclerc was just 10 then, and that moment changed everything for him. Today, he's the director of operations for the Canadian Space Agency. The Apollo program was not just a dream of engineers. I mean, it was really a national ambition that was shared with the rest of humanity. So I think if we will have the same kind of uh, ambitious goals set for us going, going back to the moon and this time going back for good, we want to have an, a sustainable presence. I mean, with the times, timelines that we've given ourselves, before the end of the, the next decade, we will have permanent colonies on the moon. So how do you do that? Well, after that first walk, more astronauts went back and walked some more. I was strolling on the moon one day. But the last was in 1972, just three years after the first. You collected them at the time? Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, that was, You were uh, how old? I was 12, yeah, 12. And amazed. It was. This changed my life, you know, watching this happen. It was, it was very cool. Randy Atwood is the executive director at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. He says after the U.S. won the space race, people and politicians lost interest in the moon. A bit been there, done that. Many people may not know that 12 men walked on the moon. Um, and it's, I think, it, you know, when they landed on the moon, there were already headlines about going to Mars by 1980. But what was missing about going to Mars, but also going back to the moon, is a reason to go. You know, it was political back in the 60s. It was, it, was an op it was an opportunity to go because technology had reached a point where we could go. You couldn't go in the 50s, rockets were blowing up. But computers were getting small, rockets were working, and there was this race to beat the Soviets uh, on, on the moon. Everything just clicked. It was a perfect storm, which we haven't had since then. Vietnam also consumed budgets in the 70s, and by the 80s and 90s, space stations became the focus. But now, there is a race back to the moon. What we've been doing with international partners for the past 20 years is on the space station, learning about life sciences, learning about how to conduct experiments, we're going to use that, that knowledge now to go to the moon. All right, so do be careful. So this is the moon? This is apparently an analog for the moon. And a mock surface outside Montreal is where Canada is test running its own contribution. If you look at putting uh, a habitat on the lunar surface. Ken Podwolski runs Canada's contribution. The plan goes like this. Just five years from now, NASA will put an astronaut back on the moon. At the same time, it'll launch the makings of a new space station, a thousand times further from the Earth than the ISS. It'll be called Gateway, and in 2026, the latest variant of the Canada arm will be added, an inchworm moving across the moon orbiting station. And that's gonna open up and go into longer missions, basically in the objective of proving that we can go to Mars. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. That is the ultimate goal. I mean, and how does the moon help us in that pursuit? So the idea here is we're putting out a waypoint. So with the gateway, we'll be able to establish a permanent presence closer to the moon. And then that will give us an intermediate point for then if we want to go beyond that, this basically opens up that highway, that railroad to go out into further, further into the solar system. While Canada's artificial intelligence and robotics will help build and sustain the new space station, on the moon itself, our rovers are key to the next phase. 
They'll help identify and guide astronauts to resources. There's ice up there on the moon, which means water, and in it, oxygen, fuel sources too. So what is normally hauled all the way up from Earth may be sourced right on the moon to help propel people to Mars. And is there any reason to think that there is a gas station on the moon? Uh, we've pretty much proven it to ourselves. I think there's enough science out there now that we know that there's subsurface ice. We know we have the technology to be able to take that ice and melt it down and generate hydrogen and oxygen. And from that, we can actually put together fuel. And this is going to build up that, you know, that railway of logistics that connects the Earth to the moon and then to beyond. Going all the way to the red planet is bold, a seven month journey from the moon, perhaps with even more waypoints to build along the way. First step though, is back to the moon. And Atwood says the timelines to do that in less than five years are not only ambitious, but perhaps unrealistic. Walk me through that, because you have your doubts. Well, these programs take a lot of time. And a lot of these, you know, back in 1989, President Bush number one said we will be back on the moon on 2019. Here it is 2019, and we're no closer to going back to the moon than we were in 1972. So it's, it, Space programs only work if it has politi political support. It took a full eight years and a full commitment of a country to do that back in the 60s. You don't have that full commitment. You don't have commitment of, for the U.S., you don't have the commitment of the Congress. I don't think we have the commitment of the people. Uh, it just seems to be a political juggernaut, just, you know, what, what sounds good today. The idea of going to the moon in, by 2024, I think, is, is nearly impossible. Not to mention, the Canadian Space Agency hasn't even announced who will build Canada's signature contribution, the latest Canadarm. But Ken Podwalski says the various Canadian companies behind the technology are prepared. From our point of view, it's very doable. Um, it's not our first rodeo. We know how to build space robotics and we're the, we're the world leaders in it. There's no reason why we can't be operating in the lunar vicinity. There's no reason why Canadian astronauts can't be going out there to the lunar surface. So this is this is very real. I mean, Canada is really going to the moon. Uh, the future is really here. As for that kid from a half century ago who grew up to help lead Canada's role in space. The thing that gets me most excited is actually learning to work and live on another body. I mean, this is, we, we see the moon travel through the skies every night. I mean, it's been a dream of mine. Why, why aren't we there yet? If all goes to plan, a very ambitious plan with very short timelines, Canadians could be way up there within the next decade. David Common, CBC News, Saint-Hubert, Quebec. We'll have special coverage of the landmark anniversary all week. Tomorrow, we stay focused on Canada, where it's not just the government that's got its eyes on the final frontier. We're a, a, a space business, and what we do is we design, build, launch small satellites for communications. A look at private industry looking to cash in tomorrow night on The National. I'm Michelle Shepard filling in for Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. With teacher Neil Bantaman back in Canada, we look at the bizarre case that sent him to an Indonesian prison. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We are live here in the National at 1048 Eastern Time. A Nova Scotia court today heard a former police chief admit to sending inappropriate Facebook messages to an underage girl. John Collier served with Bridgewater Police. He's now on trial for sexual assault and sexual exploitation. Among his messages to the 17-year-old, you are hot and hanging out in your room. If I was alone, I would get in trouble. Collier has categorically denied the assault allegations. The trial continues in September. And a trial has begun for a 17-year-old accused of shooting a German tourist in the head while they were driving near Calgary last summer. Testimony today suggests it was a case of mistaken identity, that the team believed the tourist was a man who had attacked his brother. The 61-year-old victim was left paralyzed on his right side and still has trouble speaking after eight bullet fragments were removed from his brain. 
Barry and Honey Sherman's daughter has lived in fear for months. 18 months ago, her billionaire parents were killed in their Toronto home. But now she is speaking out because she doesn't want the charity work of her parents to falter. It's an alarming situation and I, have, I feel I do have to be on guard. But that's not going to stop me from doing important work. A bit of background. The Shermans were one of Canada's wealthiest couples. Barry was the founder and former CEO of generic drug giant Apotex. In December 2017, he and his wife were found strangled on the deck of their indoor pool. The crime led to international headlines, dueling police and private investigations, but no arrests, just theories. But as I mentioned, there's not a shred of doubt about the generosity of the Shermans. It is estimated they donated more than $100 million to various causes. And their daughter wants that work to continue. Her name is Alexandra Krawchuk, and she spoke with our Joanna Romiliotis. So, Joanna, can you explain for me, first of all, how, how this interview that you did with her came about in the first place? Well, we met her at the Liberation 75 launch event, and Liberation 75 is a global conference for Holocaust survivors, and it will be held here in Toronto next year. And Honey Sherman was the lead sponsor, the Sherman Foundation was, and Alex, her daughter, has now taken on the mantle, if you will. So yeah. she'll be carrying on her parents' legacy. So when we met her there, we wanted to talk to her about that, about the desire to carry on that legacy. We wanted to talk to her about how the family is coping, um, given that, you know, this awful um, tragedy happened and they still have no real answers. So here's a little bit of the interview and what she had to say about that. It's definitely a big struggle. Um, all my siblings and I have been struggling since, you know, for the past 18 months. Um, for me personally, it, it comes in waves and it's unpredictable. I couldn't leave my home for several months because I was too scared. Hmm. And Joanna, did, did she mention anything about the investigation itself? Because that's still the big question mark here. Well, they wouldn't talk. As a family, they haven't spoken about the investigation, and that was certainly a ground rule going into the interview. But it has been reported that the family has hired a private investigator. So there's a parallel investigation going on. Um, they have expressed their dissatisfaction with the lack of answers um, in, in terms of the police investigation going on here in Toronto. So she did speak to that and how that affects their ability not only to process the grief that she talked about earlier, but to kind of find a way past it. And here's a little bit about that. It complicates things, of course, right? I wish we could have uh, an answer so that everyone could sleep a little bit easier at night. And I hope, I still hope and have faith that that will happen, that there will be um, hopefully an arrest and a conviction. I hope that that's the case um, because living in a state of fear and uncertainty is, is really hard. What's the hardest part of it? Um, just not knowing why this would happen to good people who are, you know, lights in their communities, pillars of strength to everybody who knew them. Um, it doesn't make sense to me that, that anyone could harm them. So a lot of hope, but no clear end in sight. No real answers at all. Joanna, thanks. You're welcome. Up next, three teenagers went for a late night spin and stumbled into an act of kindness. People are saying, you know, oh, you should be proud of yourselves. You know, your parents should be proud of yourselves. The community could take a lesson from this. What they did is our moment of the day. So three Ontario teens went that extra mile to help a stranger. Well, an extra seven kilometers to be exact. They'd been out for a late night swim when they spotted a car in trouble. It was the middle of the night on a dark highway. So they offered to give the driver a push and their feet is our moment. We saw this lady on the left lane coming towards us that her car stopped and she put on her four ways. So we pulled behind her and asked what the problem was. And then we realized that there's no coolant left in the car. Uh, after we pushed the car into the Tim Hortons parking lot, uh, we looked over a bit and the lady was saying how she couldn't really, she was in no position to be able to get a tow. Billy looks over to us and goes, you boys ready to push? And I'm like, you're crazy, but we were totally down for it. Boys, we're three quarters of the way there. Let's go. Parents didn't exactly know we were out that late uh, until the next, next day. Morning, yeah. Both of our parents came into our rooms and said, hey, so what's the deal with saying no until 4 a.m.? And I was like, oh, you know, we're just hanging with some friends, you know. And my parents go, oh, uh, because I saw on Facebook that you guys pushed a car to Welland. And I'm like, oh, yeah, about that. 
it was one of those crazy experiences that we'll be able to look back on in you know 10 to 15 years and just be like, hey, we did that. And that was pretty cool. <laughs> I love those dudes. I love that they are all wearing baseball caps the same way. I love that they didn't brag about it to their parents. Uh, I, I just, I'm really, I'm, in, I'm into those teenagers. Way to go. <laughs> well, and that's the best part. I mean, they didn't really brag to anyone. No. And, you know, the story, part of the reason the story got out was because another stranger actually stopped, and it was a dad. He said, look, I just wanted to make sure the kids were safe. He drove behind them the whole way with the headlights on so that no other cars would hit them, and, and he's the one who took the pictures. We have all pushed cars before, right? We were talking about that in the commercial break. <laughs> kind of a rite of yeah. Canadian passage to not, at least not help that push far, a car mind you. out of the snow. Yeah. yeah so yeah. when I was a kid, or like 17 years old, I had a Volkswagen Beetle that stopped working, and my friends and I pushed it from one end of town to the other. I looked it up. The distance was only two kilometers, <laughs> and it killed us. These guys did 7K <laughs> yeah. for a stranger. So. As all of you said, fantastic uh, mm. kids. It'd be nice to uh, see how those uh, young men do uh, this next year in their hockey and other mm. activities. Yeah. Anyway, that is The National for Monday, July 15th. Good night. Good night. <laughs>